Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher's history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fist, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher's history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, welcome into a teacher history of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that during the War of 1812, Russia actually tried to get involved to mediate a peace between the United States and Britain, which, of course, was unsuccessful? And that prior to the Battle of Bladensburg, a battle that is usually viewed by historians as one of the most embarrassing battles in American history, President James Madison had to rely on his own Secretary of State for recon when trying to figure out where the British soldiers were landing and marching. And that following the burning of Washington, D.C., many members of Congress actually wanted to move the capital city either further north or, as you probably guessed, further south. Did you know all of this? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will cover that and more in episode 103, The British Burned Down, Washington, D.C. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Um, I hope the extra credit from last week was helpful. Of course, we covered the Northwest, uh, the fighting in the Northwest and the Great Lakes, and Zach detailed a lot of that for you. There are... A ton of different battles and a lot of moving pieces in that theater in the war. So I apologize if it was a little confusing. Um, I always struggled when when studying the War of 1812 and teaching it. I always struggled to condense that down into a, um, you know, reduce it down into a more digestible, into more digestible chunks. But it, it's certainly not easy. Um, before we get started here, a couple things real quick. Number one, thank you to new patrons. We have over at patreon.com. Uh, we really appreciate the support. We have David at the honor roll level and both T- Tiffany and Matthew recently joining at the teacher's pet level, which is really awesome. So thank you so much. Thanks for supporting the show. Um, we really appreciate it. We, we couldn't do it without um, the patrons. So uh, if you feel so obliged, you go over to patreon.com and sign up. That would be great. Additionally, uh, I love a recent review we got on iTunes, and it is from uh, Psycho Splunker Seventeen. Which is quite the name. Said, "I love your podcast. You were just what I was looking for to help me understand U.S. history from 2019 update perspective. I appreciate the content, the historical knowledge, as well as much needed consideration and sensitivity we need to engage our history." Um, to tend to our present time for the more comprehensive understanding of what's happening in the U.S. and the world contextually. I'm on episode 22. Each episode is rich, informative, concise, and easy to listen to. My recent desire to learn more about U.S. history was sparked over the summer. I've learned so much in the first 20 episodes. Thank you. Your podcast has indispensably become part of my weekly re-education. I don't know who wrote that, but thank you so much for the review. Glad it is helpful. And if you, once again, feel so inclined to write a review on iTunes, please feel free. Um, and then last thing before we hop into the episode, a, cu- a couple corrections. I was, I was listening back to the Q&A, and I noticed at one point I said something about uh, John Adams keeping us out of war. And I mentioned that he kept us out of war with Britain, uh, which is, of course, not accurate. He kept us out of war with France. It was during the Quasi-War. So that was a slip of the tongue there for me. Um, so I apologized, and last I apologized. And last week in episode one hundred two, I actually introduced the episode as episode one hundred one, and I didn't even realize the mistake until I had already, you know, produced it, finalized it, put the episode out there. So uh, sorry if that made you do a double take, um, and you were a bit confused on that. All right, enough updates. Let's get into 
the War of 1812. So we left off, you know, at, at this point in the war, it's spring of 1813. The U.S. found itself in a better situation, arguably, than it had in 1812. They had about 30,000 men all told in the U.S. Army at this point. William Henry Harrison was leading in the West, and Andrew Jackson, future President Andrew Jackson, was emerging as one of the rising military stars in the Southwest. On top of this, young men such as Winfield Scott and Zebulon Pike, two men we will be talking about a lot more in future episodes, were also seeing expanded responsibility in the U.S. forces. In addition to the increased manpower and the obvious reality that many of them had seen experience in the field at this point, the U.S. also made improvements in both their logistics and supply lines, better supporting these men in the field. At this point, something that Zach mentioned last episode, the U.S. knew that they needed to act as quickly as possible in order to try to secure a victory in the first year or so of this war. They needed to do everything they could to take advantage of the fact that Britain was still involved in a war with France, a war that it seemed Britain had taken control of. Because once Britain's attention was no longer diverted, it was likely the U.S. would not be able to stand up to their overwhelming advantages. And as Zach and I covered last episode, the beginning of the war really was not going well for the United States of America. Eventually, they won a couple battles, especially with Oliver Hazard Perry um, on the Great Lakes and, and a couple other small naval engagements. And the morale was raising, but... The fact that the United States of America failed to conquer Canada or really conquer the British in the Great Lakes in 1812 or 1813, many Americans felt like they had really exhausted their best opportunity to end this war and to end this war quickly. In the winter of 1813, the U.S. had scored some victories in the Northwest and in the South. And by the way, it's just a reminder, we'll be getting into the Southern Theater in its entirety in a future episode, so don't worry, we're not skipping over it. But even with these victories, things were not looking quite as good for the U.S. as they had hoped. Canada was never actually taken from the British. The Royal Navy was sailing pretty much unmolested in the Atlantic, and the British were putting their focus on the Chesapeake. They had approximately 85 ships sailing along the Atlantic coast in the Caribbean. The primary goal for the Royal Navy at this time was to protect the shipping lanes from Halifax to the Caribbean, while simultaneously blockading the United States from commerce overseas. The strategy to counteract this throughout the course of the war was for the U.S. to use hit-and-run tactics and privateer ships to try and disrupt the blockade as much as they could. As the war progressed, though, the U.S. was able to win some single-ship engagements against the British and found that more often than not, when an American ship went up against a British ship of the same size, strength, magnitude, etc., the U.S. seemed to often come out on top. Unfortunately, the overwhelming numerical advantage that the British Royal Navy had was just suffocating for the United States. On a side note, um, a a privateering in case you didn't know, is a person or ship that engages in maritime warfare under the commission of war. So in other words, if you owned a ship and you wanted to use it to fight the enemy, you just had to get a piece of paper saying it was cool. And considering these privateers would commonly share spoils of their battle with the person who issued them the commission, it wasn't too difficult for a determined, motivated ship owner to officially become a commissioned ship during a time of war, which would be a privateer. And you may be wondering, well, what's the difference between a privateer and a mercenary? Ah, A mercenary usually gets paid a flat fee, whereas a privateer gets paid when they capture a ship and secure valuables from it. So, like, mercenaries work on salary, privateers work on commission. But let's not pretend like these privateers weren't impactful, because they were. It's reported that they captured more than 1,300 British ships throughout the course of the war. And, you know, many of them were, you know, recaptured by the British. But still, 1,300 is an impressive number. But, of course, that did not prevent the British from still enforcing a crippling blockade as those 1,300 ships were just a small percentage of the total number of ships available to the British. This blockade began in 1812, and throughout the course of the war, it became more strict and more expansive. 
It first spread to the south and mid-Atlantic, and then after the conflict with Napoleon had ended in 1814, it spread to the New England region. But let's get back to what's going on on land and in politics at this time. During the winter of 1812 and 1813, Russia had tried to get involved with this war and work as a third party to bring about a mediation and end the conflict. After a lot of back and forth, though, Britain refused to accept any possibility of making peace with the United States based on the proposed terms. Britain felt like the U.S. had started this war. They were the antagonist, and to make matters worse, they likely did it at the urging of France. At least that's what many in Britain believed. In the minds of many men in Parliament, the U.S. needed France, and once word would reach the U.S. of Napoleon's impending defeat, they would back down. Britain, therefore, was in no mood to end the conflict now, when the odds were in their favor that they would be able to win the war outright. So with Russian attempts at an armistice rejected, President Madison's primary focus was to convince everyone as best he could that there was reason for both hope and optimism. And Madison did this admirably. In December of 1813, he addressed the nation, trying his best to put a positive spin on the war up to this point. Madison trumpeted the victories on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario and complimented many of the American officers for their bravery and leadership so far in the war. Madison then went full-blown optimist, claiming that even though they had not won the war yet and, in fact, they were in an unenviable position, the war had mandated that America greatly increase their manufacturing domestically. Additionally, Madison explained away why the war was taking so long and moving so slow. Madison said that, quote, Our free government, like other free governments, though slow in its early movements, acquires in its progress a force proportioned to its freedom. But all of Madison's optimism could not ignore the reality that Britain had the upper hand in Europe and was planning on refocusing on the United States sooner rather than later. So beginning in, and we're backtracking a little bit here, to March of 1813, but beginning in March of 1813, this is when Britain really began to set their sights on the Chesapeake. It was right near both the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and a primary port city in Baltimore, so it was the perfect spot to target. The British set up a blockade of the bay and raided towns all along the bay throughout the spring and summer of 1813. While the British were honing in on Chesapeake Bay um, in the summer of 1813, James Madison actually fell really sick, which is just something I thought would be interesting to note. Um, it was some historians believed that it was malaria or maybe a severe migraine, but it, this is when Madison was truly at his lowest point. With rumors of his death spreading around the nation, the U.S. showed little progress in the war, Congress divided, and the Royal Navy blockading the coast. You can understand why things were not looking very good for our diminutive uh, little friend. But by the end of June, he was feeling much better. Madison made sure to present himself publicly and made a strong showing politically. In July of 1813, the U.S. responded to this threat by building a flotilla of 20 ships to defend the Chesapeake from the British advance. The flotilla was eventually launched in April of 1814, and while it was able to have some effect on the war landscape, it wasn't able to prevent the British from marching on the nation's capital eventually. So the timeline here, right, early spring, uh, the war, early spring 1813, the war is still going on and major battles are still going on in the northwest and Canada. Um, and now the British are setting their sights on Chesapeake. Throughout 1813 into the summer, they continue to prepare for an attack on the Chesapeake. This is when Madison becomes sick. Things are transitioning from uh, the theater in the northwest in Canada into the Chesapeake now. And it's at the end of 1813, December, when Madison makes this speech to America to try to, you know, rally the troops, so to speak. Um, and then we move into the spring and summer of 1814 when the actual attacks begin. So this was really a drawn-out process of um, attacking D.C. and Baltimore. 
in Ju- by July of 1814, uh, the British were finalizing their plans for attack. It, it was at this point um, Britain had taken care of Napoleon. Napoleon had been defeated. Reinforcements had quickly arrived for the British, and they were ready to strike and overwhelm the United States of America. And um, their fighting with Napoleon was one of the reasons they delayed as much as they did um, throughout 1813 and early 1814. While they considered Washington, D.C., Baltimore, um, and Philadelphia, British Rear Admiral George uh, Coburn, which is spelled Cockburn, but it, I believe it's pronounced Coburn. At least that's what um, the uh, British historians I have uh, read and listened to pronounce it. So we're going to go with Coburn. Um, recommended the Washington, D.C. should be their first target. Seeing how it would be both easy to take and would have a massive political impact, it makes perfect sense, right? And what Washington, D.C., as you know, it was still a very young city. It had only been around, it had been around less than 20 years. It was basically a swamp with a handful of random, beautiful government buildings there. Uh, there was no real protection there. Very few people lived there. And so they knew they'd be able to march on D.C. easily. It wouldn't really be defended. And they also thought if they burned down all of these official government buildings, it would be really symbolic and it would have a massive impact, which it did. So with these plans in place, Britain readied their forces of 4,500 men for an invasion of the city and had orders to literally exact revenge on the U.S. for what they had done in Upper Canada. Sir George Prevost, recounting the destruction that the U.S. had done to them in Canada, told the British forces, quote, In consequence of the late disgraceful conduct of the American troops and the wanton destruction of private property on the north shores of Lake Erie, In order that if the war with the U.S. continues, you may, should you judge it advisable, assist in inflicting that measure of retaliation which shall deter the enemy from a repetition of similar outrages. Basically, it means if you have an opportunity to burn stuff down, burn it down, and then maybe that will keep the U.S. from burning down more of our stuff. With this advice in mind… Alexander Cochrane, the commander-in-chief of the Royal Navy in North America and the West Indies, advised Coburn to, quote, destroy and lay waste such towns and districts as you may find assailable. You will spare merely the lives of the unharmed inhabitants of the U.S. On August 24th, 1814, the British scored a massive victory over the U.S. in the Battle of Bladensburg, which allowed them to march on Washington, D.C. Madison and his officers had been going back and forth on whether or not the British would actually attack Washington. Baltimore seemed like a much more logical target, but Madison nonetheless prepared as best he could to defend the capital. Because in the summer of 1814, the British began to sail toward Washington overwhelming any Americans that stood in their way. They landed on the eastern shore of Maryland and slowly made their way closer to the capital city. The challenge was that the British were advancing in a way that confused the U.S., not allowing them to determine whether they were attacking Washington or Baltimore. The British should have traveled up the Potomac right to D.C., D.C.'s on the Potomac River, or take the stealthier route of the Patuxent, which would involve quite a bit of hiking. They decided, after much deliberation, that the Patuxent was their best option. The Chesapeake Bay flotilla of 20 ships, which I mentioned a little bit ago, was just sort of lingering in the background, and the British were a bit wary of it. The week leading up to the Battle of Bladensburg saw the British moving really slow. But because of the lack of effective communication, Madison really had no idea where they were, where they would attack, or when they would attack. With little recon to rely on, James Monroe, the Secretary of State, traveled out to Benedict, Maryland on August 20th, four days before the battle, to do his own investigation. After spotting the unloading British troops, Monroe figured that Washington, D.C. was in fact their target. While it was likely too late to do much about it, Monroe wrote to Madison that they should do everything they could to defend the capital city. So just take a moment and let this one sink in. James Madison, the President of the United States, a man with no military experience, was trying to prepare for an actual invasion of the nation's capital, and his only source of intelligence was his Secretary of State, James Monroe. 
So let me repeat. In an attempt to defend the destruction of his capital city, the U.S. president was relying on an actual member of his cabinet on horseback to relay him information on British troop movements. And we wonder why people say that the U.S. wasn't well prepared for the War of 1812. On August 22nd, two days later, Madison wrote to Monroe trying to talk himself out of a British invasion of Washington, D.C., seeing that it was far from where they had landed their fleet. But with British troops making haste right toward the city, Monroe informed Madison that not only are the British going to move on the capital, but it's not going to be pretty. It was at this point Madison realized just how bad things were, lamenting to Monroe that, quote, I fear not much can be done more than has been done to strengthen the hands of General Winder. As fast as suckers, that is reinforcements, arrive here, they will be hastened on to the defenses. But the crisis, I presume, will be of such short duration that but few even from the neighboring country will be on the ground before it's over. On the morning of August 22nd, Madison rode out to meet General Winder, who was the man uh, put in charge of the American troops for the Battle of Bladensburg. He left Dolly behind in the White House and told her to be ready to leave with the valuables on a moment's notice. The next day, Major General Robert Ross, the commander of the British troops in the Chesapeake, had settled outside D.C., and this is August 23rd, to prepare his force of more than 4,500 men for the attack. Originally stuck with just under 2,000 poorly trained and non-experienced American soldiers, Brigadier General Winder wasn't too enthusiastic about his outlook. But with the furious recruitment over the last week or so, he had somewhere between 5,000 and 9,000 men. It depends. Like, Winder said one thing, Ross said another thing, Madison said another. The numbers are all over the place, but the likely number is probably closer to about 6,000 American troops. So... Think about 6,000 American troops to 4,500 British troops. But keep in mind, many of these 6,000 American troops are militia who are volunteering. Um, They're men who are incredibly poorly trained, have no experience. So uh, the numerical advantage isn't what it seems. A few days prior to the battle, Winder had realized that this town of Bladensburg was going to be the key strategic point, seeing how all roads to Annapolis and Baltimore ran through Bladensburg, while also having one of two main roads to Washington, so it was the obvious place that the British were going to march toward. But Winder, God bless him, was just so confused. He really didn't know what to do. He marched his men out to Bladensburg, began to set up defenses, and then changed his mind and marched back. When Brigadier General Tobias Stansberry, the man who brought reinforcements from Baltimore per Winder's desperate request, saw Winder retreating, he decided to pull back right retreating before the battle began. He, he, he decided to pull back his original location in Bladensburg, abandon the high ground, and cross the bridge and set up new defenses. This miscommunication ended up having Stansbury and his men, obviously, across the river from Bladensburg, not even protecting the exact roads that they needed to protect in the first place. On noon of August 24th, the British troops began their advance, and Stansbury's mistakes were undeniable, right? And I'm not excusing Winder here. I mean, he gave extremely poor and confusing instructions, but Stansbury just made some obvious mistakes. He was on high ground, and when he saw Winder move his men the day before the battle, he moved off of this high ground. He didn't occupy any of the buildings that would have made it more difficult for the British to take. And when he crossed the bridge to relocate prior to the battle, he didn't even burn it, which meant it had to be defended, which is very difficult to do. And what was a somewhat short and valiant fight by some America American militia and regulars, this battle saw incredible miscommunication by both Winder and Stansberry and some truly amateur military tactics. It was at this point that the Secretary of War Armstrong was sulking and frustrated that Madison did not put him in charge. And uh, the fact that Winder was given command, he more or less refused to give substantive advice on how to fight the British. Like right before the battle, Madison 
asked him the day before the battle of Madison asked him what Winder should do. And Armstrong just pointed out that uh, American – the Americans have militia and the British have regular soldiers, so the British were probably going to win. That was his contribution. Then the day of the battle, he continued to just give literally no advice, whether that was because he was unwilling or unable or a combination of both. No one will ever know, but um, there are letters indicating that it was probably a combination of both. You couple that with Winder being completely overwhelmed by the circumstances and gravity of the moment, and it's no surprise that this was an easy British victory. Heck, it had been an entire lifetime since Monroe, who was trying to help Winder here, had been in the battlefield. And I think Monroe hadn't seen a battlefield in 30 years. And as recently as 1812, Winder, he was an attorney, not a soldier. So American leadership at this battle was struggling. Armstrong refused to give advice. Madison had no idea what he was doing. Monroe hadn't seen a battlefield in 30 years. And the commander of the American troops two years earlier was practicing law. When the British formed up on the east bank, they were likely smitten to see the Americans lining up, clearly having no idea what they were doing. Winder had his men line up in three lines, with a half mile separating the first two lines and a mile separating the second and third line. And we have to keep in mind here, the range of a musket was less than 100 yards, so these enormous gaps between the lines just allowed the British to divide and conquer each American line pretty easily. Now, to be fair, the casualty numbers, if you just look at the battle on paper, the casualty numbers for the British were higher. And one of the major reasons is because of the cannon that the, um, the heavy artillery that the Americans were shooting were, were killing a lot of, a lot of British soldiers as they marched toward the line. Um, another reason is because when the British advanced, it didn't take too long for the first two American lines to retreat. The third line put up more of a fight, but with the, Americans, at this point wholly outnumbered, Ross and his British troops were able to outflank them and force the final retreat. The battle only lasted about three hours, from about 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Once it was clear that the Americans were going to lose the battle, James Madison sent messengers to his wife Dolly, telling her to retreat immediately and abandon the White House. Upon receiving these frantic messages, Dolly furiously ordered the carriage, gathered up as much silverware and valuables as she could, hopped in, and fled as quickly as she could. As Dolly was packing up the White House, American soldiers were retreating and literally running through the streets of Washington, D.C., and they had no idea where they were supposed to retreat to. They had been given multiple different directions on where the retreat would be. And uh, in the end, it was just a bunch of American soldiers running all over the place, which gave this battle the nickname of the Bladensburg Races. And historian David Walker Howe stated that he thought it was the, quote, greatest disgrace ever dealt to American arms and, quote, the most humiliating episode in American history. Ouch. While the battle was going on, many others in Washington, uh, other than Dolly Madison, were packing up their stuff as quickly as they possibly could to evacuate to Maryland or Virginia. By the time the battle was over, Madison had already retreated back to Washington, D.C. He and Dolly stayed the night in Brookville, Maryland, a town that proudly announces that they were once the United States capital for a day. Naturally, the British, after the battle, marched unopposed right into Washington, D.C. Now, Ross was a pretty cautious guy, and he originally was not big on the idea of burning down D.C. He thought it was one step too far, and actually many of his soldiers during the burning thought it was one step too far. In fact, some historians believe that while he was being egged on by his fellow officers, if Americans had come out to greet him and ask for some type of peace or leniency, he likely would have obliged. But instead, someone shot at him and shot his horse right out from under him. So much for leniency. It was at that point that apparently Ross pointed to the house where the shot came from and said, burn that down and oh yeah, burn the Capitol. (laughs) So the British first set their sights on the U.S. Capitol building which at the time was by far the most impressive and important building in Washington, D.C. The British set it aflame, 
and the fire grew so quickly that, ironically, they weren't able to collect enough wood to burn down the stone walls completely. The Library of Congress and its 3,000 volumes were destroyed, and it was estimated that three-quarters of a million dollars in damage was done to the building, which was a ton of money in 1814. The troops then turned their attention to the White House. In a, a, a bit of a funny story, Dolly, who had anticipated that President Madison would return victorious, had actually put together dinner for 40 people. She had meat roasting, her husband's favorite Madeira wine on the table. Everything was ready for a great feast. And some accounts say that, and who knows if this is true or not, but some accounts say that when the British troops arrived at the White House, they sat down and enjoyed the feast um, and the wine before burning down the White House. Whether it's true or not, who knows, but a, a fun story nonetheless. Now, of course, at this point, if the British were in Washington, D.C., the Madisons had both fled the home, and many of the valuables were packed up and shipped out too. Now, one of the common stories is a myth that Dolly Madison, on her way out of the White House, like personally grabbed and carried the portrait of George Washington uh, and, and packed it with her. But according to Paul Jennings, a former slave of the Madisons and eyewitness to the event, said that isn't quite how it happened. In fact, Dolly did order the portrait to be taken down, but she did not do it herself. Jennings wrote, quote, it has often been stated in print that when Mrs. Madison escaped from the White House, she cut out from the frame the large portrait of Washington and carried it off. She had no time for doing it. It would have required a ladder to get it down. All she carried off was the silver in her reticule, as the British were thought to be just a few squares off and were expected any moment. Instead, Jennings claims that the doorkeeper and gardener were actually the ones who packed it up and shipped it off prior to the British arriving. The British then moved on to burn the War Department and the Treasury Building, even though all the valuables had been removed from each. It's said that after the British were finished with D.C., the only government building that remained untouched was the U.S. Patent Office. Yay. In the end, the Capitol... The arsenal, the dockyard, treasury, war office, and the president's mansion were all destroyed, some proactively by the Americans to prevent the British from profiting off of them. In retrospect, though, things maybe could have been a lot worse. Less than a day after the attack began, an extremely powerful thunderstorm came through D.C. with high winds, in fact it had a tornado, and heavy rains. Now, it's up for debate whether this storm made things better or worse for the city, but either way, the British decided to head out after it died down. About a week later, President Madison returned to the destroyed capital city, with Congress a few weeks behind him. Madison called for the Americans to rally and protect Washington from future attacks. Oh, and on a side note, when Congress did return to D.C., they met at the Blodgett's Hotel, while they waited 15 months for the new Capitol building to be built. The news of the burning of D.C. did not go over well in America or in Europe. Some were appalled by the lack of respect the British showed the U.S., and many in Parliament and in Britain were embarrassed by these actions. But many others justified it, claiming that the U.S. had committed similar atrocities in Canada, like the burning of York, which Zach and I spoke about last episode, and claimed that the U.S. started the war, so it was only fitting that the British take whatever steps necessary to end it. One of the inhabitants of York, Reverend John Strachan, actually said that the burning of D.C. was, quote, a small retaliation after redress had been refused for burnings and depredations, not only of public but private property committed by them in Canada. One really interesting development that came from the burning of D.C. was a very genuine and serious movement to try to move the capital city. In the late summer and fall of 1814, there was a lively debate over the location of the capital. And it makes sense. D.C. was sort of in the middle of nowhere. And now that all the buildings were burned down, is there really a good reason to keep it there? With northerners wanting it moved to a place like Philadelphia, or really anywhere further north, and Southerners dreading the idea of moving north of the Mason-Dixon line, which is basically the northern border of Maryland, Congress decided to keep the location along the Potomac by an 83-54 to vote 
on September 21st, 1814. With the considerable damage to the buildings, Madison and Congress decided to just rebuild the whole thing, which took longer than expected, with the Capitol building not being completed for 12 years. Next episode, we'll be moving just a little bit north up what is today I-95 to cover the Battle of Baltimore, Britain's attempt to take the port city and dominate the Mid-Atlantic. And we'll also, of course, talk about the story behind the Star-Spangled Banner. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed.